We've all been there before knowing that we need to make changes in our lives, but then feeling paralyzed with fear and not knowing what to do next. Or maybe life comes in and just pulls the rug right from underneath us and we're forced into changes. And then we feel fear because we don't know what's coming next. Regardless of how this happens, we have all been faced with the fear of change and it can be debilitating for so many of us. But get this, when we're afraid of change, we're also afraid of life. <laughs> and in this video, I'm going to help you get rid of that fear of change. We are going to cover in part one, the spiritual reasons why we are afraid of change. And some of these reasons may surprise you. And then in the second part, I'm going to share my simple five step process to help you overcome the fear of change so that you can live your life with excitement instead of dread coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, Heart Alchemy is now open. Hello, beautiful soul. This is Christina Lopes, the Heart Alchemist. That intro that you just saw is from my brand new coaching program, Heart Alchemy. The enrollment window for Heart Alchemy is now open, ding, ding. And it's going to stay open until February 8th. So if you wanna join me, I'm gonna leave links in the description box below so you can join me. You have until February 8th to enroll. Heart Alchemy is an immersive eight week coaching program that's going to have weekly group coaching and healing sessions, weekly video modules, customized tools, activations, and a really strong community component where you can connect with other students, myself, and the trained coaches that are going to be working with us. So if you're ready to work with me on a deeper level, heal significant stuff in your life and step into a path of joy and purpose, consider joining us in Heart Alchemy. I only open this program once a year. So if you're thinking about it, make sure to join us. I'm going to leave links in the description box below and I hope to see you there. Okay. On to part one of the video, why we fear change. <laughs> So the fear of change is quite normal. It's, it's, uh, uh, rampant. There are so many, so many of us fear change and a lot of the information out there, videos and blogs, a lot of the recommendations and the information out there having to do with the fear of change. It comes from a mindset and psychological perspective. Okay. So there's a lot of mindset and psychology hacks out there in order to help you get through the fear of change. But what I have found and in watching my videos, if you watch my videos, you probably know what I'm going to say next. And that is that I like to go way deeper than psychology and mindset and just regular personal development stuff, because we have to get to the spiritual root of why we fear change. The fear of change is ultimately, and first, this is the foundational thing about the fear of change. It's an energy issue first. And only then does it translate in the mind or a psychology or mindset. Okay. And so if that energy issue isn't addressed, then it doesn't matter how many psychology hacks you use. It's going to be really difficult to kind of overcome this fear of change. If you haven't addressed the spiritual reasons for it. All right. So I wanted to get that out of the way. We're going to go deeper in this video into the spiritual reasons, into the energy reasons in understanding why we fear change so much. And then once we get to that route, then it's going to be much easier to overcome the fear of change. Now here's a little side note that I want to leave here. Ding, ding. I want to leave this little side note here before we get into the reasons why we fear change. And the side note here is important for you to remember. Okay. Because otherwise you may feel like a failure uh, later on, if you continue to feel fear when changes come into your life. And the side note that I want to leave here is that the fear of change is completely normal. Ding, ding. <laughs> the fear of change is completely normal. You're not a failure. There isn't anything wrong with you. If you fear, uh, feel fear when changes come into your life. All right. So the fear of change is normal, but here's what's going to change. When you learn how to overcome the fear of change, you may still feel fear when things happen in your life. When changes occur, you may still feel fear, but the quality of that fear is going to change as you learn how to work with this. And as you get through this video and the steps that I recommend in this video. Okay. So let me get into what I mean by the quality of fear. All right. So we can see the difference. So you're going 
going to be able to see this so crystal clear um, as you're working through this video with me. So what do I mean by the quality of fear is going to change? Well, when we initially feel fear of change and we haven't done any work around it, we don't understand even what's going on, usually what happens is that initially before we understand how to work through the fear of change, the quality of the fear is very paralyzing. It could be very debilitating. It can cause us to run. It can cause us to try and escape. It can cause us to avoid things. Okay. So initially when I don't know how to work through the fear of change, that fear, the quality of that fear is going to be much more powerful. And it's go fear is going to have control over my life because basically it's going to be causing me to paralyze, to avoid uh, taking any action, to avoid making changes. It's going to do a bunch of different things to kind of push me away from feeling the fear. And that's going to paralyze me. Okay. So initially the quality of the fear, when I don't know how to work through the fear of change, the quality of that fear is very debilitating. It can be very controlling and it can have a lot of power over us. All right. So that's the quality of the fear. I want you to feel into this energy. This is when the fear is so powerful that it forces you to do things to avoid the change. Okay. So, so that's initially what happens when we don't know how to work through the fear of change. And here are a couple of key features of this quality of fear. When I don't know how to work through this fear, I, it's going to develop a couple of qualities that, that you can maybe catch in yourself. And the first one is a paralyzing quality. Okay. So that's an important word paralyzing. When I don't know how to work through the fear of change, that fear can paralyze me. So meaning that if I feel like if let's say I have an intuition that I really need to do something, but I'm so scared of even thinking about it. So I, I just go sit on the couch and I turn on the TV and I watch Netflix. <laughs> okay. That's the paralyzing quality of fear, meaning that there's a part of you that knows you need to make changes, but then the fear comes in and it literally grips you and it paralyzes you from taking action. Okay. So this is one feature of this type of fear, this quality of fear. The second one is resisting. All right. This, this occurs more when life comes in and pulls the rug right from underneath you. So this is when the changes you weren't expecting the changes, something just comes in and your life is just, just, just comes torn apart. Maybe the loss of a relationship, maybe the sudden loss of a job. And when this happens, when the change occurs outside of our control and against our will, that's when this feature of the fear can come in and it's very resisting, meaning that even though life is forcing me to change and something just happened outside of my control, I am still going to grab on for dear life and I'm going to go kicking and screaming even through the changes. Okay. So these are two qualities of fear that happen and that I allow myself to go into when I'm afraid of change and I don't know how to work through it. Okay. So I want, I want you to feel into this quality because this may be something that that is affecting you now. Now feeling fear like this is very restrictive and it's a little bit anti soul. <laughs> okay. This is a really weird word to say anti soul. But what I mean is that when I allow myself to get into the grips of this kind of fear, what I end up doing is I I end up doing things that are kind of against what my soul wants. Okay. Because my soul is actually always excited with changes because the soul, your soul is very expansive in its energy. It's not afraid of change. Your soul wants to keep moving along just fine with a lot of excitement. And so if I let myself fall into this paralyzing and restrictive kind of fear, I end up not being able to listen to my soul. My soul is all excited saying, yeah, let's go. Meanwhile, the human self is going, no, no, I can't do this. This is too scary. <laughs> and so you're going to set up a little bit of a separation, um, a little bit of a, not a conflict, but a little bit of resistance between your human self and your soul self, which is never afraid of change. Now, after working through this video and learning how to overcome and work through the fear of change, 
the quality of the fear is going to change. Okay. So again, going back to what I was saying before, you may never lose the fear of change. So sometimes it may be completely normal for you to be afraid, feel afraid of change in the future, but the quality of that fear is going to change once you learn how to work with that fear. Okay. Let me give you some really concrete examples and some really concrete characteristics of this quality of fear. Once you've worked through this, the fear, the quality of fear changes from paralyzing and restricting to a feeling that is more exciting. It's an exciting. So I still may feel fear, but, but it's an exciting fear. It's a, it's an expansive fear. It's a fear that has no limits. It's, it's, I feel the butterflies in my stomach as I'm feeling that type of fear. Okay. So these are some characteristics of how the quality of the fear changes. You see how this is different. It's totally different when I'm afraid, but I'm excited at the same time. That's a very different quality of fear. Then if I'm afraid and oh my God, I feel so paralyzed. I feel so constricted. I, feel, I can't do anything about it. I'm paralyzed right here. Totally different qualities of fear, even though fear can be present in both of these states, you see. And as you learn to work through the fear of change, you're going to go more into this bucket of maybe feeling fear. Sometimes when your life is about to change again, it's normal. There's there no failure on your part. If you feel fear, but the quality of the fear is going to turn into more of a, an excitement butterfly in my stomach kind of fear. Okay. So I wanted you to see the difference between these two states so that, you know, as we're working through this, and as you're getting used to and mastering the art of overcoming the fear of change, you're going to know right away, which bucket you're falling into. So let me give you a concrete example so that you can really see the difference between these two types, this quality of fear and how these two types of fears are different. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've ever gone skydiving. Okay. I've gone skydiving and I am deathly afraid of heights. Okay. So when I decided to go skydiving, I remember that as soon as that airplane door opened and I was tethered to my instructor and I literally felt the wind and I knew that I was thousands of feet up in the air and I was just about to throw myself out of a plane, knowing that I was deathly afraid of heights. That was a moment that you can capture. That was what it, that type of fear that I want to talk to you about, which is I was scared shitless that I was going to just jump out of a plane, but ding, ding, the fear was a fear of excitement. It was a fear of excitement. On the one hand, I was scared shitless, but on the other hand, I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> okay. Do you see this quality of fear? It's different. I was excited. I was afraid, but I was excited and I was ready to jump out of the plane. Okay. So this image shows you the difference between these two qualities of fear. One is paralyzing and one is exciting. Okay. Now the point that I'm bringing these two types of fear to you is that even as you master the fear of change, you still may feel fear, but the key here, here's the ding, ding the, here is the, the, the million dollar bank here. The key here is that when you learn how to work through the fear of change, fear will no longer control your life. Oh, that's what I hope I can, you can get out of this video. Fear will no longer control your life. Yes. I may still feel it when something happens in my life and I'm about to go through a major change. I may still feel fear. No problem. I understand it. It's perfectly normal. I'm human, but fear will no longer control me. That's what I'm hoping you get out of this. So now let's get into more of the spiritual energy, uh, stuff that I was talking about. Okay. So, so if the fear of change, isn't merely a mindset or psychology issue, then what the heck is going on spiritually that causes me to fear change, right? There are a few things going on. The first thing that's going on, the first major thing, and I'm going to talk about these in order of importance. Okay. So the first thing going on is the foundational thing that's going on, which is I have an unstable first chakra. Ding, ding. I have an unstable first chakra. All right. Now, uh, here's a picture of the chakras of uh, the seven main chakras. If you don't know what they look like, and now let's zoom into the first one. Okay. So this is the first chakra. It's red in color. It's at the base of your spine. This chakra is the foundation of the whole system. And this chakra also happens to be the chakra of safety and survival. 
okay? This is the chakra of safety and survival. This is the chakra that lets me know whether I feel safe in my environment, whether I feel safe in my family, in my home, in my life, okay? This first chakra is the key to everything, really, to this fear of change, because this first chakra is the first one to come online and it sets the foundation for everything else occurring in your system, all right? And so if this first chakra, the first one to come online when I'm still in my mother's womb, that's how this is the first one, first one, and I stay in first chakra consciousness for quite a few years after I'm born, usually around six, seven, eight, okay, is when this chakra, this we're in primary first chakra consciousness in the first years of our lives, okay? Now, if I experience any situation in my life at that time where I feel unsafe, where there's something unstable about my environment, where or something's going on and I just don't feel safe. As soon as that happens, a lack of safety in my surroundings is going to cause that first chakra to destabilize. All right. The first chakra, here's something important to understand about the first chakra. The first chakra is always looking for stability from the outside. Okay. This is a very outwardly projected chakra, meaning that if everything's okay in my home, if the family situation is good, if I'm well fed, if I have a roof over my head, if I feel safe, then the first chakra is retrieving that information and it's using that information to say safe. We're safe. Okay. Everything's okay. All right. The moment something happens on the outside that causes a bit of, of instability, the first chakra says, okay, not safe, not safe. <laughs> So the first chakra is very connected to the outside world and it uses the outside world to let it know whether something is safe or unsafe, stabilizing or destabilizing. All right. This is an important feature for you to understand because when it comes to healing the fear of change, we're going to have to learn how to reprogram this particular aspect of the first chakra. But I wanted, I wanted to let you know that this is an important feature that we're going to be talking about a little bit more later. Now let me compare this feature of the lower chakra with the other ones. Okay. So this feature of the first chakra of relying so heavily on the outside world to inform it, this feature is a little bit different from the other chakras. As I start to go up in the system, as I start to go up in the system, those chakras are easier to program from within, meaning that they can stabilize themselves depending just on what's going on within me. So they don't rely so much on the outside environment as that first chakra, but the first chakra is primordial. It's a chakra that's very related to the outside material world. It's the most physical of all chakras. So it makes sense that it's also the most connected to the, to the outer world. All right. So this is a little bit of a difference so that you understand that this particularity is very different. The particularity of being so connected and reliant on the outside world is a particularity of this first chakra that doesn't really exist in the ones above. The ones above are a little bit more self-sufficient. Okay. So I wanted to leave this here. Again, this particularity is going to come in handy for you to know that because that's how we're going to help you heal the fear of change later on. Another way of looking at this first chakra that sometimes really helps people understand how it functions so differently from the rest of them is that this first chakra, it, it kind of behaves a little bit like a child. <laughs> uh, you'll understand why this is actually the home of the inner child, but I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But the, the functioning of the child, this chakra is a bit, a little bit more immature sometimes than the other chakras. Okay. It functions a little bit like a child. And so imagine that you are, you, ha you have a child, imagine you have a small child and they're really upset. Okay. Just, just imagine the epic tantrums of a small child. Okay. Now you have one or two things to do. If a child is really so upset and they're just screaming and crying and they're just screaming and crying. And if you go up there and you grab the child and you just hold them, they're going to calm down much more quickly than if you go to a little child and say, stop crying. What are you crying about? Figure yourself out. <laughs> That's not going to work. It's only going to make them more upset. So you see the child relies on that beautiful tactile feedback from her outside environment in order to calm down and, and kind of uh, regulate herself. That's the word I wanted to have here. 
regulate. The child needs outside input in order to regular, regulate herself. Whereas the upper chakras, they're more adult-like, especially as you're growing up. So when you're an adult and you're crying, you don't need someone to come and hug you for you to, for you to regulate yourself because when you're an adult, you know how to regulate yourself, okay? So you're not excessively reliant on the outside world for self-regulation, but the child is. The child really is reliant on the outside world, on caretakers and people that love them in order to regulate themselves. The first chakra is kind of the same way. It has this more rudimentary programming where it relies significantly on the outside world to tell it whether things are okay or not to regulate it all right so again a feature that we're going to use in a little bit this first chakra is also the place where a couple of things happen that are absolutely crucial for you to overcome the fear of change and it's one of the reasons why we feel such fear of change, right? The first thing is this is where you initially you start to build the foundation of trust, okay? Trust, trust, trust comes foundationally from the first chakra, all right? So do I trust that I live in a safe environment, that all is well? Do I trust the universe? Do I trust that everything is going to be okay? This is a key feature that comes initially from the first chakra. If I don't trust, so if something happens in my environment and I feel unsafe and I begin to just not trust the universe, not trust life, not trust anything, then what's going to happen is that first chakra is going to develop a wound, okay? This is the primary wound of the first chakra and it's called control. All right. The moment that that first chakra starts to feel and perceive itself destabilized because there's something going on in the outer environment that's not safe, the first chakra will turn on the chip of control. All right. And this means that when I don't feel safe, I'm going to try and control everything around me in order to then get this, this feeling of safety. All right. So trust and control. These are two issues that happen in the first chakra. When I don't trust control comes on and when I do trust control diminishes okay so it's kind of a seesaw when I when I have one thing the other thing diminishes when I have the other thing the other thing diminishes all right this is important to know too because now you're gonna have in the back of your mind constantly that in order for me to work through the fear of change I have to develop trust and lose control so the more unstable and ungrounded this first chakra is, the more I'm going to fear change, right? Because what's change? Change is literally me going into the unknown. I'm going into the unknown and I can't go into the unknown without fear if this, if this first chakra is destabilized because if it's destabilized, I'm not going to trust. <laughs> and so imagine trying to go into the unknown without trust. Of course, it's going to freak you out. <laughs> Let's go back to the, to the example that I used of skydiving, all right? I'm deathly afraid of heights. So when I go skydiving, that first time that I went skydiving, when that door opened and I was literally about to throw myself out of a plane, <laughs> If I had not trusted the instructor that I was tethered to, right? When you go skydiving, you're tethered to an instructor. You're in front and the instructor's in the back and you are literally tied to this person. You're tethered to them or you would die. <laughs> and so imagine if that door opens and I start to have a feeling that I don't trust this instructor. What's the, what if the instructor's drunk or what if the instructor's high and I start to perceive that he's drunk or he has alcohol in his breath and I, oh my God, I don't trust. Do you think I would throw myself out of a plane if I didn't trust the instructor that was tethered to me? <laughs> no, right? So this is a little bit of an example of how, of how this first chakra works. Also, if that first chakra does not have trust imbued in it, then it, the, the fear of change is going to be exponential because the first chakra is going to be pulling you back from the unknown because in the unknown, the first chakra can't control anything, right? And so this is a good example to show you just how important the first chakra is. And this is why this is the first, the first thing I'm talking about is, is a destabilized first chakra because if this first chakra energy is not corrected, then the fear of change is going to be almost impossible to overcome. 
The second reason that we can fear change is because we have a sabotaging inner child. <laughs> okay, now the inner child in the first chakra, they kind of go hand in hand because the inner child lives in the first chakra. The inner child is a sort of a sub-personality, an energy part of you. It's that beautiful part of you that's playful, that's childlike, that's, that's always excited about life. That's called the inner child. And when I have an issue with the fear of change, that inner child is most certainly sabotaging me on, in one way or another, okay? And usually what happens is this inner child starts to sabotage when it's wounded in some way, okay? So uh, it's probably, this is probably having to do with something, some time in your life when you were a child where maybe you felt unsafe, where you had a destabilized outer environment. That can really wound the inner child. And so then when you grow up, that inner child personality, that inner child part of you, it, it's, it's kind of stunted and it goes through life just freaked out about everything and terrified about everything. And it keeps sabotaging you in many, many ways that a lot of us don't even know that we have a wounded inner child. All right. So this inner child is a beautiful part of you when it's healed, but when it's wounded, it can really take control of your life and really sabotage you in a lot of ways. Okay. So, um, so this inner child, although it's connected to the first chakra, I wanted to talk about it as a separate issue because this is something that we're gonna to have to work through and you have to work through uh, in order to overcome the fear of change. And the way that I, that I like to look at how, you know, how this energy is playing out within us is if you take the first chakra and you call the first chakra your home, for example, the inner child lives in that home. So if that first chakra is destabilized, the inner child is immediately going to feel uh, fear. She's going to feel she's not going to trust because the first chakra is destabilized already energetically. So she doesn't feel safe in her home, which is the first chakra, all right? Now, children are by nature very trusting. They are very, very trusting beings until their trust is betrayed. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but if you ever betray the trust of a child, it's, it's hard to, to regain that trust. Okay. And it's because children are so open. They're so trusting, but then when they suffer the pain of betrayal, they really recoil and it, and it's hard for them to trust again. Okay. And you have to work through this process. And when a child, when that inner child does not trust you, that's when they could really start sabotaging your life because they are going to try and take control of your energy system. And a lot of times we don't even know that sometimes the, the change, the fear that we have of change is actually coming from this inner child holding us back because we've never connected with the inner child and we didn't even do that work. And we didn't know that the inner child could actually take control of the whole energy system and prevent you from, from doing a lot of wonderful things in life out of fear. Okay. So, so that's the second reason that it is that that inner child is wounded and it's really sabotaged you and really, really, uh, causing this, uh, helping to cause this fear of change that you may have. The third reason that we fear change is because we have a controlling ego. Okay. So, so now you see at the third, the third reason is when we get to the mind. All right. So the ego, basically the ego is, um, it's your sense of identity. All right. The ego is the part of your mind that says I mine me. <laughs> okay. It's the part of your mind that develops a sense of identity for yourself. It's the part of your mind that sees you as a separate thing out from the outside world. Okay. So there's a you and there's the world. All right. There's a me and there's the world. The mechanism that makes this possible for you to see the world in this way is called the ego. It's your sense of identity basically. Now, when I I'm talking about this in third place here, because the energy is already destabilized in my first chakra, then my inner child's freaking out. And only then will I come, will that, will those energy issues come up to the ego? All right the mind, it develops your personality and your ego. They developed based on what they are interpreting from the lower chakras. Okay. So the development of your personality, a lot of people don't realize this, but the development of your personality has everything to do with the quality of the energy in your lower chakras, especially these foundational chakras, first, second, and third. Okay. 
So your mind will basically start to perceive the energy, interpret it, and then make a personality for yourself that's based on that energy. Okay. So if my, if my uh, developing personality and developing ego, the ego starts to develop around seven, six, seven, a little bit of differences depending on the person, but that's when the ego really starts to reinforce itself. It starts to look down on that first chakra. It retrieves the information of the first chakra to develop your personality. So if the mind looks down at the first chakra and your first chakra is destabilized, afraid of everything, the world's not safe. If that's the information that the mind is getting, it's going to develop a strengthened controlling ego to respond to that lack of safety. You see, so the ego in essence initially is a protection mechanism. It can serve as a protection mechanism. It's trying to protect you. But the flip side of that is that it usually causes a lot more suffering than it does protect you. Okay. But understand this play between the lower chakras and the mind so that if that first chakra is destabilized, my ego, the likelihood that my ego is going to develop into a really controlling ego is pretty high because it's trying to make me safe. The more controlling my ego is, the more I'm going to fear change because the ego is going to set itself up as a really rigid structure. Anytime the ego perceives something unknown, it's going to fire alarms and say, don't do that. That's ridiculous. You don't know what's over there. You could die. You could, <laughs> all these things can happen. And so these voices start to develop in your mind that keep you away from making changes in your life because the ego doesn't know how to work through the unknown, right? The unknown is something that the ego cannot control. And so the, it's going to develop voices that they're going to try to convince you to not change things. So for example, your ego, let's say you have a really strong intuition that you need to change jobs. You need to quit this job and change jobs. And your ego can be like, you're not going to do that. What, what if you don't find a job? What if you then lose all your money, can't pay your bills, you're going to be destitute living under a bridge. <laughs> you see, this is an extreme, but I'm sure you've had these voices in your head before these apocalyptic voices. This is your ego, your controlling ego at play. All right. And this is a really important facet. This can really, really wreak havoc in your life and contribute enormously to the fear of change. Okay. On to part two of the video, how to overcome the fear of change. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to share five steps with you and these steps are in order. Okay. So I want to leave this little side note here. These steps are in order. Sometimes the tips that I, that I share with you aren't in any specific order. These ones are in order because we have to work with the foundation first. Okay. So these are in order. Uh, the first step that we're going to work on is we're going to strengthen and ground the first chakra, the foundation of the problem. Okay. We're going to ground and stabilize this first chakra. So there's the first chakra response. It's the most embodied of all chakras. It responds to a lot of body work, a lot of embodiment stuff. So dancing, drumming, putting my feet on the ground, taking my shoes off and my socks off and walking on the bare earth. That's called earthing. Um, a lot of drumming. I love drumming. I use drumming a lot, a lot of dancing, being in my body, being outdoors, hiking, just connecting with my body, exercising. The, those things are very grounding to my body. The more that I come out of my head and into my body, the more I'm grounding that first chakra. All right. I also like to work with a lot of affirmations. Okay. So I'll like to, um, sometimes I'll just put my hands on my first chakra uh, below the belly button, right at your pubic bone. You put your hands there and you can start working with affirmations. Like I am safe. Everything's okay. I live in a benevolent universe. <laughs> Everything is always working out for me. You see, these are beautiful affirmations that start to calm and ground that first chakra. So a lot of these techniques, a lot of these body techniques, a lot of this first chakra work can be paired with this type of affirmation to start calming that first chakra and helping it ground more and more. And here's the aspect now of this first chakra that's going to kind of bring in what we talked about before. And that is it's really important for you to program this chakra 
to feel stable and grounded within itself. Okay. So in other words, we're going to program this first chakra to not be as dependent in the outside world as it was originally when you were a child. Ding, ding. This first chakra can be programmed to look within more instead of looking outside for a sense of stability. The more that you can get this first chakra to get a sense of stability and groundedness from within, from itself, from within your own system, then I mean, this is going to be a breakthrough for you because when you realize a lot of us don't realize that our, our chakras don't need to be dependent on the outside world. They don't need to, maybe they are initially when we're children because we don't know how to do better. But when we grow up, we can also switch our energy system into a more mature energy system. Okay. So this is really like big girl, big boy work here. And that is turning and programming your chakras to be more mature, spiritually mature. A spiritually mature chakra does not rely on the outside world for anything. Okay. It may interact with the outside world, but it doesn't depend on the outside world. All right. And this is really key for this specific first step, because as you teach that first chakra to rely on information from within in order to, to, to feel stability, then the fear of change is literally going to melt. <laughs> okay. Because what's going to happen is the first chakra is going to be deriving information from within you. So when you say everything's fine, we're safe, I'm grounded. I'm a mature spiritual being. Everything is okay. Change is wonderful. You see, as soon as you start to program that first chakra with that information, the chakra stabilizes immediately, regardless of what's going on outside of you. You see, when you pull in that energy of the first chakra and, and you get that first chakra to rely only on your own energy system for its stability, then you pull that energy out. Then it means that you can actually be going through significant change in your life and you could feel calm and peaceful through it. All right. So this trick is important and this trick you can do nice and slowly just by having the self-awareness that you could actually do this, that you could program that first chakra to rely on itself instead of relying on the outside world. Uh, it's going to change everything for you. But I like doing this through a lot of affirmation and mantra work, just talking to the energy system, just saying we're totally fine. We're, we're mature adults. I'm a mature adult. I can weather any change. I live in, in a benevolent universe. I can trust the universe. I could trust my guides. I can trust that everything is always working out for me. The more you have this inner talk and you use these inner affirmations, the more that first chakra will ground. And here's another advanced pro tip to get you into this really grounded place. All right. Because I've been talking about trusting the universe, but there's something else you have to trust too. <laughs> and you may not have noticed that this plays also in the fear of change. And that is you have to start trusting yourself. Ding, ding, <laughs> trusting yourself. You may not realize this, but we can only feel a fear of change. Ultimately, if there's a part of us that doesn't trust ourselves, <laughs> you see, when we feel a fear of change, it means that there's a part of us really deep in that subconscious or maybe not so deep in the subconscious, but it's usually pretty um, unconscious to us. There's a little voice down there in that psyche that believes that you are incapable of navigating the changes. You see? And so if there's a part of you that says you're incapable of navigating any changes, then of course your energy system is going to freak out when change comes. All right. And so this is a pro tip for you. It's time to start trusting yourself, not just the universe, but yourself. You are a divine, powerful, spiritual being. Your soul is so powerful. Your soul loves change. It, it thrives in change. You are perfectly capable of navigating any changes that you need to make in your life or any changes that life makes uh, to you. 
Now to help you further ground this first chakra, I did a YouTube live activation. It's called the first chakra healing. Um, it's a beautiful audio meditation that you can now download from my website. I'm going to leave a link to that, to that meditation. It's in the free resources page of my website. You just scroll down and you're going to see this beautiful meditation, download it. It's free and start working with that meditation. That's going to be another great tool to help in the grounding of this first chakra. Step two is to do inner child work, right? So we were talking about the inner child really being capable of sabotaging your life and it contributes significantly to the fear of change. Well, now we have to do inner child work. And what this really means is that I'm reparenting. The term is reparenting my inner child. All right. That's the term that's used in psychology, but it goes a little deeper than that. It's not just reparenting. It's you coming in connection with that beautiful child, understanding that child, listening to that inner child, understanding why she's scared. It's so important to listen. All right. So when I'm doing inner child work, I have to be able to listen to that inner child. I have to be able to understand. I have to be able to love her, but there's an important aspect that really needs to happen so that this inner child doesn't sabotage you anymore. And that is when an inner child takes over my energy system and sabotages it, the image that I, that I use sometimes is that it's like that inner child comes into the driver's seat of your car and she's driving the car. <laughs> Well, you don't want a child driving your car. It's adults that need to drive the car. So what you're going to do is the work of the inner child is really, you're going to grab that inner child from the driver's seat and you're going to put her in the back seat where she's supposed to be. That's where children are supposed to be in the car in the back seat where the child can just enjoy the beautiful ride, maybe even stick their head out the window and just have fun and be carefree. Your inner child needs to be carefree and playful. She's not an adult. She cannot take on adult responsibilities. So don't give adult responsibilities to your inner child. All right. That's part of the inner child work is making that child understand that you, the adult are trustworthy. You need to be trustworthy because if you're a mess of an adult, then your inner child isn't going to trust you. And for good reason, right? So you need to get yourself in order, meaning that that trusting of self, I'm perfectly capable of navigating change. I am an adult. I'm a mature being. I'm a, I'm a powerful spiritual being. The more that you stand in that power, your inner child is going to start trusting you more. And then she's just going to release control. All right. So this inner child work is really important. I'm not going to go too deep on, on actual techniques for working with the inner child because I shot a whole video on that. I'm going to leave links in the description box below so you can go deeper into actual inner child work, uh, after watching this video. The third step is to quiet the ego. All right. So, so look at this now, now in step three, this is when we get into more of the psychology stuff, right? Because we've already corrected the foundational energy issues that are going on, uh, that, that really contribute are, are the biggest contributors to the fear of change. All right. So now it's time to get into the ego and start to quiet that ego down. Basically what you're trying to do here is you want to, to really deflate that control controlling ego that's really formed to, to really keep control of everything you're doing in order to, to keep you away from the unknown. Uh, controlling ego really fears change a lot. And, and so if your ego is controlling, don't think it doesn't contribute significantly to the fear of change. Of course it does. But what I was just saying is that the foundational stuff is, is more important, but the ego can also really, really be problematic and cause more fear of change. All right. So you want to calm that ego down. You want to quiet that voice. And basically energetically what that looks like is that the ego, a controlling ego has a really strong grip on your life and you're going to slowly dissolve, dissolve that grip, quiet the ego, dissolve the grip. And the reason that I'm saying quiet the ego is because a controlling ego never shuts up. Oh my God. A controlling ego is just constantly going through talking, talking, talking in your head, constantly nonstop with different scenarios and different things and different fears. Okay. So, so that, that mechanism needs to quiet down. The more your ego quiets down, the more you can start seeing things from your soul's perspective. Ding, ding. Oh, this is so important because when my ego is controlling, when it's screaming at me, I can't hear my soul. I cannot hear my soul. And that's even contributes to more fear because if I'm disconnected from my soul, I can't feel that part of me that's actually excited with the change. You're 
Your soul is excited because change represents expansion and the soul is always excited with expansion. So if your ego is screaming at you so much that you can't hear your soul, you're going to let yourself be caught up by the fears of the ego. All right. Instead of connecting to that soul part of you and saying, it's okay, ego, everything's fine. I understand why you're screaming at me, but I need you to quiet down because I'm going to do this. My soul is telling me to do this. So I'm going to go with the soul. All right. It becomes much more easier to do that when your ego isn't screaming as loudly uh, in your ear. Okay. So the quieting of the ego, another way of saying this is you're going to, you're going to drop down from your mind into your heart. That's another way of saying this. The heart is the portal of the soul. The more that I connect with the heart, the more that I drain my energy from the head into the heart, the more than I can navigate change without feeling a, a paralyzing fear. All right. So there are many ways for you to, to work on quieting the ego. My favorite way is through meditation. Meditation was absolutely life changing for me. So I highly recommend it. If you're not meditating yet, you should be meditating because it really helps quiet and quiet and quiet that system down. There are a bazillion different types of meditation. Experiment around with different types of meditation, see what suits you and try to at least squeeze in a meditation practice every day, at least for 10 minutes. Okay. It's going to be significant and it's going to really help you go through this, this, um, this, uh, create this art of being able to overcome the fear of change. So it doesn't paralyze you and, and really cause a lot of suffering in your life. Ultimately, what's going to happen is as through meditation, as the mind quiets down more and more and more, what's going to happen is your ego is actually going to change in energy. It's going to go from being really controlling and really rigid to really open and flexible. Okay. And this is because the ego can be trained to see that change isn't dangerous. Okay. Because initially the ego is screaming at you when, when there's change coming in your life the ego screaming at you because the ego has perceived change as dangerous. All right. As a danger. Okay. And as you're working through the ego and you're quieting the ego down more and more, your ego is going to be trained to perceive change as exciting. <laughs> That's going to be a huge shift when your mind starts to perceive change and the unknown as exciting, as opposed to fearful, that's going to change everything for you because this ego will stop sabotaging you and it'll start working as an instrument to help you navigate those changes. But another cool thing here that this is actually a side effect. So I was talking about meditation as a good way to quiet the ego, but there's also going to be other things helping you quiet the ego. And that's because you've already followed step one and step two. So you've already corrected the, the first chakra energy imbalance. You've already worked with the inner child. And so just that, just stabilizing this first chakra and stabilizing the inner child, it's going to start feeding information up to the ego that everything's okay. Everything's okay. Says the first chakra and the ego starts to say, Oh, okay. Everything's okay. I can relax a little bit more. You see when the first chakra stabilizes the ego relaxes, ding, ding. Okay. The ego relaxes. So by just doing the, the steps that we were talking about previously, you're already going to be doing ego work, even though it's indirectly. All right. So then on top of that, if you add some meditation to quiet the ego down further, pretty soon, the fear of change is going to be something of the past. If you want to go deeper on the ego and how to work with it, I shot a video on that and I'll leave links in the description box below. It's on the ego and how the ego isn't your enemy. Uh, you can watch that one after this video. Step four is work with fear. Okay. So these last two steps are just really a culmination of the foundational work that we've done. All right. So by the time you get to this step, you've already stabilized the first chakra. You've already stabilized the inner child and you've already started doing ego work. So your ego is starting to quiet down. And now this is a more advanced step. We're going to start to learn how to work with fear in a completely different way from how the brain is programmed to work with fear. <laughs> okay. So our brains are biologically prepared to keep us away from any possible dangers. If you think of it from an evolutionary perspective, this was a very important feature when we were out in the Serengeti and anything could kill us in any moment. All right. So the brain was developed to always be looking for danger, whether it's a lion, a poisonous snake, whatever it was that we were living when we evolved. Okay. 
Well, that feature is no longer necessary to the extent that it was before. And in fact, that feature that the brain has is very problematic for us now. But you can train the brain to see differently. In other words, you can train yourself to work with fear in a completely different way than you ever did before. Okay, so normally what we do when we feel fear is we step away. Oh, we step away from the fear. It paralyzes us. We turn the other way. We go somewhere. We escape. We turn on Netflix. We do all kinds of things to escape the feeling of fear. All right. So generally what we do from an energy perspective, when we feel fear is we step away from it. We run from it. All right. Well, now in this step, what you're going to do is precisely the opposite <laughs> because when I feel fear and I step away, what I'm saying to my brain is that was dangerous. I need to stay away from it. That's what you're saying to the brain. And so the brain is going to continue to be trained with the perception that fear means move away. Fear means move away, says the brain. Okay. But what you may not realize is that you can train the brain to see the emotion fear differently. You can absolutely do this. And so what we're going to do in this more advanced step is you are going to learn to, when you feel fear, you're going to step into the fear. You're going to step towards the fear, not away from it. What this is going to do biochemically in your brain is really, really interesting because what your brain is going to do is your brain is going to say to itself, wait a minute. She just felt fear, but then she stepped into it and she did it anyways. So that must mean it wasn't dangerous. Ding, ding. This is what the brain is going to see. You have to be able to divorce the idea that fear and danger go together, go hand in hand. Sometimes they do, sometimes they do not. And you have to train your brain to understand the difference. Okay. So you have got to separate fear from danger. They are not the same thing. All right. And so what happens is when you feel fear, let's give a concrete example. Let's say you have the intuition to quit your job. You really have this really strong intuition and you say, I'm going to do it. And you start to feel fear. Okay. Your brain is used to saying, okay, she's feeling fear. That means don't quit your job. That's a bad idea. Danger, danger, danger. All right. Well, now what you're going to do is in this practical example, you're going to take a nice deep breath. You're going to feel the fear. You're going to honor it. You're not going to push it away. You're going to welcome it. You're going to embrace it and you're going to go right through it nonetheless. And you're going to quit your job. All right. As soon as you do that, your brain's going to say, wait a minute, she felt fear, but she still went into that. So it must mean that quitting job does not equal danger. <laughs> you see, and your brain is going to continue to be trained that any time that you may be feeling fear, but that fear doesn't always mean step away. Fear can sometimes mean step into. And the more that you train your brain to do that, your brain is going to start calming down its alarm systems. So you'll feel less and less fear when change comes because the next time change comes, let's say you quit your job and you get another one and you're happy. And let's say, you know, you're dating someone and you, you don't think the relationship is going anywhere. Now that you're, you've trained your brain to not see fear like danger. What's going to happen is your, your brain may say, you say, I have an intuition. I think I really need to, you know, I think I need to dissolve this relationship. I need, I need to break up with my partner. And your brain will go, it'll perceive that you're leaning into it and your brain will go, Oh, not dangerous. That's not dangerous. Leaving partner is not dangerous. <laughs> okay. You see, these are just a couple of examples to show you that you can absolutely do this. Lean into the fear. Whenever you lean into the fear, you'll, you'll be training your brain to not perceive fear as synonymous with danger. And this is crucial. The more that you learn how to work with fear as an honorable emotion, nothing that you need to be afraid of, nothing that you need to run from you're training your entire system to learn how to navigate change. That's basically what you're doing. You're training your system to learn how to navigate change. And the fear is going to start diminishing, diminishing, diminishing until pretty soon change is going to be exciting for you. All right. So working with fear in this way is crucial. You can learn this. You can do this one step at a time.
Step five is mindset work, all right? And this is really the icing on the cake, basically. This is the last step that I left here. And is it an interesting, right? I'm The last step that I'm leaving you is basically techniques that are generally recommended to start working with the fear of change. Well, in, in this case and in this video, this is the last step because we have to deal with all the spiritual stuff and all the energy stuff before, all right? By the time you get to this step, it's almost gonna be occurring by itself. Your mindset is going to be changing by itself just because of the energy and the spiritual stuff you're doing in the steps before, all right? But you can add some extra components here to help this mindset shift. You're basically, you basically want to, to shift from a mindset that is constricting to a mindset that is expansive. Okay. And so what this means is that this, this may take a little bit of practice because when the brain wires to do something, it's going to have a lot of neural networks dedicated to that. So in order for me to change a habit, whether that habit is an action or whether it's a thought for me to change a thought and a mindset, I have to practice. Okay. That practice is really, is really the fuel that makes the brain change. All right. So when it comes to mindset work, what I'm talking about here is that you're just going to start training your mind to see change with expansiveness instead of constriction. All right. See it as exciting instead of dangerous. All right. And you can do this. One, one of the simple techniques that I like doing is, is using refocusing. All right. So this means that you may have to do this a hundred times a day. If, if you have a really negative mindset and you've been really fearful of change for a really long time, you may have to do this like a hundred times a day, but that's okay. Practice makes perfect. All right. And so what you're going to do is you're going to catch yourself when your mind starts to go into that negative thing, you know, so let's use the example of you quitting your job. Oh my God. But if I quit my job, I may not get another one. And then I may not be able to pay my bills. And then pretty soon I'm going to lose my house. And then pretty soon I'm going to be <laughs> under a bridge. Okay. So I'm just giving you an extreme example of where the mind goes. All right. When you catch yourself going down that rabbit hole of dark thoughts, what you can do is you can refocus immediately. Okay. So your brain says, Oh my God, but maybe I won't be able to pay my bills and you can refocus and you say, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I be able to get another job? Maybe I'll get another job. Maybe I'll get a better job. Maybe I'll get a job that'll pay me so much more and I could pay my bills and I could have, I could pay off my credit card debt and I could do all these different things. And, and maybe you see, you see what I'm doing. I shifted from maybe apocalypse is happening to maybe wonderful things are happening. And I've done that in just a fraction of a second. You have to get really good at refocusing, catch yourself before you get into the apocalyptic thing. So before your mind gets into the, Oh my God, I'm going to be destitute living under a bridge catch the loop right as it's starting. So what happens if I can't, what happens if I can't find another job and pay my bills? There's the start of the loop. Catch yourself there. Refocus. Why wouldn't I be able to get another job? There are so many jobs out there. There's so many different things I can do. I'm going to find a job easily. You see, if you catch yourself at the top of the loop, when the negative spiraling is starting, it's much easier than if you allow yourself to keep going. Oh my God, I'm, I can't pay my bills and then I'll lose my house and, and then I'll be destitute and living under a bridge. Okay. You've gone really deep into the fear loop by that time. So try and learn how to catch yourself at the beginning of the loop and refocus immediately. Okay. If you do that, you're going to literally change your whole mind and your mind is going to become more expansive and less constricting. All right. So this is icing on the cake. This is the last thing to do in the five step process. All right, beautiful soul. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comments below. Are you scared of making any significant changes in your life? I want to hear all about it in the, in the comments below. Click here to subscribe to my YouTube channel or head over to Heart Alchemy to join the program. Enrollment window is open until February 8th. And don't forget to watch these videos here that I recommended in this video. All right, beautiful soul. I love you. I'm out.